Once again, I would like to begin by saying that, hello everyone. Uh, we deeply appreciate your uh, interest in this project and we are thrilled to uh, present you about the economy. As a group, we will be discussing the history of the how it's affecting our lives. To comprehend this relatively new concept more truly, we must analyze the world itself. The term geek derives its meaning from a jazz concept. It means in the music field, a live performance by someone such as a musician. Well, what do jazz musicians do? These jazz artists play their individual compositions on the stage together. But the highlight of this definition is the world individual. That wouldn't be wrong to say that it's related to individuals and economies. But this proper explanation is a temporary or lens There are some distinct features of this field. For example, the economy connect with their clients and customers through online platforms. Most of the freelancer workers have active social media the accounts and online based banking. Now let's take a deeper look into the history of the economy, which is one of the most crucial parts in our presentation. The 2007-2008 financial crisis, which you can call as global financial crisis, was the most severe worldwide economic crisis since the Great Depression of 1929. In the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, many people were either unemployed or underemployed. As a result, demand for temporary work was exponentially as individuals were looking for ways or supplement uh, ways to replace or supplement their income. These factors were incentives for seeking job opportunities regardless of its status, durability, and future. Because what matter was not if that occupation field was meant or had a bright future. The main concern of people was to survive and take care of their family. Many people wound up holding several part-time or freelance jobs or combining the fixed contract job with a flexible new job on the site. As more people became familiar with the gig economy, the work became normalized on a larger scale and it reached to its current format. Now, my friend Simla, the second presenter of our presentation, will be giving you information about the impact of COVID-19 on the gig economy. Thank you so much for listening once again. The pandemic and the gig economy, a dynamic duo that has reshaped the world of work. As COVID-19 swept across the globe, it ignited a wave of creativity and adaptation in the gig economy, unveiling new horizons while underscoring infrastructure. With the pandemic, the job opportunities got sparse. Many traditional and big workers lost their jobs. Some had to choose between destitution and infection. Many individuals' only choice to generate income was the gig works. On the bright side, the challenge pandemic had presented definitely forced people to think more creatively in order to gain money. Or else, how we would find new ways of executing hundreds of years old jobs. For example, platform called probono.legalfice.com has transitioned its, its business model from meeting clients physically to allowing interactions online. Workers who had been already in the economy also showed incredible adaptability to meet the changing demands. They have improved themselves for the market's needs, such as musicians offering virtual concerts and fitness instructors conducting online classes. Platforms like Okay. <clears throat> Platforms like Trendio and Upwork experienced a surge in demand and as people saw delivery services and remote work opportunities. As they grow bigger, the gigs they offered has became varied. Delivery work had certain standards, and online gig works they offered are highly autonomous and flexible professions that can be conducted from anywhere in the world with an internet connection. 
But was the situation all rainbows and butterflies for everyone all the time? For the remote work situation, researchers indicate only those with adequate spaces and technologies had positive experiences. Most who lack, lacked quite spaces to focus at, and exposed to more house and child possibilities expressed a decline in their productivity. Also, in another group, the delivery workers were at a higher risk of exposure to the virus due to the frequent interactions with customers. Hence, safety protocols were created for the safety. They provided protective gears and came up with a contact for the delivery concept, and each service giver and taker didn't have to have physical it is undeniable that the pandemic had many downsides. However, it brought attention to the lack of labor protections and benefits for gig workers that would go on if not pandemic underscore them, such as health insurance, sick leave, and unemployment benefits for the gig workers. The gig economy is more impactful than ever with a reinforced structure. And now my teammate begins to talk about advantages and disadvantages about this topic. As it was previously stated, the gig economy are first of all workers and the specific markets which connect their business. While the gig economy allows workers to be time, flexible employment also might allow for greater work balance as it allows workers to make their own schedule within their own with their personal lives. As gig economy workers aren't limited to an office or a local company, they don't have to be attached to a place and can potentially work from anywhere. Short-term contract work can become a source of extra income, also allowing them to have more than one job at the same time period. Being independent workers, as these gig workers plan their time, choose their workplace and work as much as they want, it directly impacts their motivation. But along with the advantages, the gig economy also has some disadvantages for workers in this career business. Gig workers must plan for private insurance, retirement savings, and determine how much of their income to set aside each month while they are not considered as full time employees. Unlike regular employees who might organize handle food gatherings, gig workers frequently find themselves work alone and disconnected from the outside world. Whether they work from a home office, bedroom, or a co-working space, this isolation can lead to feelings of loneliness and detachment. Gig workers are constantly in pursuit of their next gig or preparing for potential changes in their current one. The absence of job security can result in stress and even anxiety, which is not typically experienced by regular employees who enjoy job security and numerous benefits. Another drawback of the gig economy is the potential for less reliable workers. Gig workers often lack job stability, which can lead to inconsistency in their availability and commitment, causing them to miss deadlines. Additionally, the absence of long-term commitment can reduce their motivation to invest fully in their work, which is a challenge for businesses and clients to find them. Um, now we're passing to conclusion. In conclusion, the gig economy proved its support during the economic crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic, offering creative income alternatives. While challenges exist, including unequal circumstances and health concerns, they prompted safety measures and labor discussions. Despite drawbacks, it works flexibility, income potential, and motivation for independent workers make it indispensable. As it continues to grow, addressing its issues through policy reforms is essential. By doing so, we can harness its benefits while safeguarding gig workers, ensuring its lasting and valuable place in our evolving work landscape. Thank you all for listening. I hope you enjoyed our presentation. Now, I would like to invite participants to ask questions. Hi, um, can you explain?
explain briefly how do you run your research? Any research design being used in this research? Thank you. Um, could you please repeat the question? I think there's a problem with the voice because we couldn't clearly hear. Briefly oh, explain what. Can you explain briefly how do you run the research? Any research designs that you have used in this research? Can you get the question? Sorry, we can't understand your question because of the uh, voice is not clear. Do you use any research methodology or any research design in your research? In our research, we uh, mainly focused on the positive advantages of gig economy. We were uh, thinking about creating a, a new and relatively new research model because gig economy relates mostly to technology and it has many advantages. We also mentioned its disadvantages because we believe that this is essential to create an effective working system or we can say model. Because uh, before, without considering its disadvantages, we can't fully focus on its um, efficient side. So while, uh, while we're creating our presentation, we mainly focus on its um, both uh, drawbacks and both advantages, and then try to uh, synthesize them to create one so that people in this new technology age can uh, work by like, as freelancer workers, however, with discipline and with uh, online networking systems. That was our point, and while we were creating our presentation, we get information from various uh, freelance workers. We spoke to them in person uh, or with uh, We also uh, create uh, uh, gather some information from the internet sources or articles, etc. Uh, last question. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, last questions. As you mentioned, some of the drawbacks of the gig economy. Would gig economy survive in the ending era? Can you get the question? In what era? Endemic. Endemic. Okay. In endemic era. Um, so what we believe is that um, gig economy is not just a system where we use in the COVID-19. Uh, I mean, it has highlighted during COVID-19 because people couldn't afford to meet face to face. But we believe that regardless of this type of the era, it can be endemic, it can be global. We believe that it will survive and it survived because of the facilities that it brought to our world. For example, by using um, gig economy, many people can, uh, without saying loyal to uh, accomplished companies such as McKinsey or etc., can create their own jobs and they can get their own income. Even if the economy of the, uh, co the country they live in is not that uh, great. For example, this can be a second or a third world country, but a, a freelancer worker in that economy, although the local economy is not great, can get higher incomes and thus increasing the um increasing the wealth level of the country so we believe that the important thing is not if the area is endemic or is area. what we believe is that if individuals are um, individuals are productive effective we believe that they can clear uh, they can easily uh, get their own income and they can get their own wealth uh, by um, by contributing to their own country. So what we focused was the, uh, our focus point was the individuals, not a specific or endemic area. What we believe is that individuals must uh, work freelance in the name of freelancers so that they can contribute to their countries. Not They don't have to uh, stay loyal to a great company. Thank you. We think Good evening. Thank you for listening again.
Good evening and welcome to the judges, teachers, guests, and participants of FIRSIS Participants from Turkey can leave the studio now. Thank you so much for your presentation. Can we start? We can start, right? Oh. Good afternoon, judges and the floors. We're from ITC School in Vietnam, and today we're here to present our research. To that step, women are an integral part of our society as they provide a very contrasting source of for men, which have balanced communities, and yet their significance and importance are always undervalued, constantly being affected by constant discrimination. Women are always, always expected, expected to, to be, be more elegant, smart, physically weak, have good looks, and not question authority. The stereotype discriminates against those looking for work and heavily discourages diversity regarding personality, creativity, and skills. Freelancing is a male-dominated profession, and there is plenty of proof to uphold that statement. Many clients think that freelancing is only for men, but outright refusing to recruit any female workers, no, no matter, matter the degree or, or background, background regarding the subject matter. So what is the gig economy then? The gig economy refers to casual and non permanent jobs that uh, include flexible schedules, variable hours, and non-contract uh, non jobs. Then how did it start to gain popularity? Well, since the advent of the internet and digital platforms, employers and employees can fulfill tasks without face-to-face -face interaction. Then, what are the changes it brought to the current economy? This newly presented economy also mitigates risk. Since workers and employers do not have long term commitments, and providing both employers and employees 
By 2021, Vietnam had about 18.9 million informal workers in the non agriculture sector and an estimated 14 million people. Vietnam's digital economy is growing rapidly. Digital development and digitization are completely changing many economic sectors, from manufacturing and agriculture to services, payment, transportation, finance, logistics, and education, bringing important contributions to the country economy. Research by Google and Temasek in 2019 stated that Vietnam digital economy reached 3 billion US dollars in 2015 increases to 9 billion US dollar in 2018 and is forecast to reach 30 billion US dollar in 2025. As women increasingly participate in gig work across various sectors, it's evident that the expectations, fear, and obstacles differ significantly from those of their male counterparts. By shedding light on these critical issues, this research seeks to contribute to policy development, societal awareness, and the creation of a gig economy that fully supports and values the contributions of women. This research employs a qualitative approach that investigates into the gig economy among women in Vietnam. The research will utilize content analysis as a primary method to extract meaningful insights from various online resources, including verified and reliable blog posts, documentaries, and government agency reports. For the research instrument, content Analysis process will be guided by three defined categories and themes. For the analysis of data, we use data collection, data coding, data interpretation, and drawing conclusions. For the results, Lan Fu, a grab driver, suffered from continuous illness, forcing her to mortgage her old house and move back to renting Undaman to have money to take care of her husband and children's education. She decided to become a grab driver. Unable to maintain her marital happiness, she became the threat, or she became the single mother. The woman from Gunther living alone in Saigon became the breadwinner from her two school going children. Young Le Fu Yang, from blogging at Yang er to doing radio on SoundCloud channel Yang er Radio to the YouTube channel Yang er reaching more than 500,000 followers in just one year. Since then, she decided to turn it into her full time job. Ha Chang, who was born in 2000, was reared in Hanoi. Bill she of course, received a significant amount of food. Additionally, she faithfully applauds him every day, sharing her experience in Korea as well as advice on makeup. Undang Gun Yang, Hana Yang Nan didn't begin studying bodybuilding until she was 17 years old. She understood that physical activity would make her physics stronger and more robust. She decided to train as a fitness coach after that. This research provides a comprehensive overview of the gig economy that part, which has the specific focus on the uh, on the experience of women in this like, rapidly evolving labor market. Moreover, women often encounter challenges related to their physical appearance as societal expectations dictating that they should conform to traditional notion of beauty. However, it is essential to address the challenge faced by gig workers particularly women, to harness the full potential of this evolving labor landscape and ensure the equitable opportunities for all. For the proposed solution, it is entitled Woven Flexible Network. Network. We collectively agree, agree upon the name Woven as this resembles both woman and the term Woven. Because like weaving, this is meant to connect strands together to expand network so that women can have a more fair economy. Our main inspiration was women environment and development organization. They are doing all they can to help improve human rights and gender equality. Some features of the program, her career, career. and apps that connect users with job opportunities from organizations that, uh, that prioritize gender diversity and also has a forum for all to share a workplace experience to support a safe working environment. We can. Yeah. A website that's dedicated to offering a safe space for women to assess reliable information and discuss uh, health concerns uh, uh, regarding the topic. Artistic Sister Sister Sisterhood, Sisterhood, an international network meant to have raised a following for those who are talented in the category of art, which includes but is not limited to painting, sculpture, printmaking, drawing, decorative art, or photography. 
In conclusion, this research provides a valuable insight into the gig economy in Vietnam with a particular emphasis uh, to, on the experiences of women. It highlights the deep-seated gender bias and stereotypes that persist in the society and affecting women's participation as well as success, their success in the gig workforce. To create a more equitable and inclusive gig economy in Vietnam, policymakers, businesses, and society must take more positive steps to further combat gender discrimination, to ensure fair wages, and to support all gig workers, especially women. This resource serves as a vital call to action to promote gender equity and create a more inclusive gig economy that values and supports the contribution of all its participants. Thank you. Thank you. Now let the camera. Now let the camera. Okay. 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 Thank you. All right. Thank you for great presentations. I just have one question. Are these proposed solutions that you have mentioned earlier came from interview or uh, data from previous research? When we, the proposed solution that we came up with was through our methods of research, which was qualitative. We went through case studies and we used secondary data to confirm which was the best option, the best, the most optimized solution to help with these problems that are aforementioned in the presentation that we just mentioned before. It has been through uh, a lot of evaluation and we picked out three of the programs that are best benefiting of all the female uh, workers in the gig economy. Um, from the many ones that we have uh, introduced up here, so approximately six, and there are a lot more, but we could not include all of them as it would uh, drag the presentation for a bit too long. We had to summarize a lot of it, but we did use a lot of, uh, let's say, case studies that were very realistic, and it came from people that we personally knew ourselves, so we connect with them on a larger level. The numbers before the response. The correct number would be around 20. We have only decided to reduce that down to number of six so that it would be much more reasonable to present to everyone. Is this random or you have purpose in samples? We do have purpose in samples. We have specifically picked out people that we know fit in these categories. They were working in the gig economy and we wanted to understand their troubles. We wanted to understand how they felt like, what they were going through at the time. We wanted to help solve what was going on. Because as we see right now, what, what we want to achieve is equality. What we need to use as to achieve equality is equity, which is at the moment what we are trying to achieve. Equality is when both sides are equal. Equity is to provide support so one side can be equal to the other side. That's what we are trying to achieve now. The gig economy is very male dominant, as we see in Vietnam. In, let's say, every 10 Grab drivers, there's only one female Grab driver. And that's not very fair because physical attributes are always more lenient on male sides, not the female side. So we need to provide them support so that in both ways they are equal in terms of knowledge and physical attributes. Uh, currently, these are only our proposed solutions, but we can see that in the future we could very possibly using these as a foundation to connect with other governments as well. So far, this is a non-governmental organization, but we look forward to making it an official one. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Thank you for the presentation. Now, I would like to invite the third team, SBP Ayrawang, to present. The gig economy. We can all observe how the sector of the economy has evolved and expanded ever since the pandemic. But has anyone in this room actually noticed the significant impact that's given to us? I'm Aimee Shua Mijani Rahman. Now, I would like to provide the objectives of our study. First, to understand the consequences of freelancers like food and services and their contribution towards the global economy. Next, to research the social status of food delivery workers outside of the traditional economy. And lastly, to summarize on what can be done as efforts in the independent workforce to ensure the security and inclusivity of the global industry. Moving on, this is our methodology in completing this research. We first we analyze journal articles and documentaries. Next, we did questionnaires and survey. Then we continued with an interview. And lastly, we did inferential statistical analysis. Now, what is the gig economy? Gig economy is a labor market that heavily relies on temporary works conducted by independent workers or frequently called as freelancers. Under the gig economy, we have sectors such as writing, food delivery, graphic designing, and babysitting. But of course, as our main topic today, we'll be focusing on food deliveries. Now, I would like to explain the evolution of the food delivery services. The first pizza is delivered in Italy in 1889, followed by in 1950. This industry began to flourish as the concept of having meals at home from restaurants became more popular as televisions became more prevalent in homes. Following that, in 1994, Pizza Hut launches Pizza Net as its first web-based food delivery site. And lastly, during the 2010s, the emergence of companies such as Food Panda and Grab began to take over the services as this business began to expand. <laughs> Very 
So the perception of saying food delivery is personally the economy is actually wrong. It's high market has dragged right into another business economies, such as the uh, motorbike industry, which provides motorcycles to the behavior riders, and the internet industry, which helps with platforms to work more efficiently. Other food delivery also helps put outlets to reach more customers, improve on the visibility, enhance efficiency, be more cost effective, and also drive profit margins with the to others. Thus, I'm signifying here that the delivery service is full of big and customers. This has answered our first objective to understand the consequences and contributions of the delivery services to its development economy. But what about the social services in the system? Ladies and gentlemen, we employed both an interviewer and questionnaire for this survey and we compiled your data for the further process of analysis. For information, we conducted this survey on 148 respondents of all ages. Now, my chart represents the percentage of yes and no responses given by respondents for the question. Do you think pay hailing riders are acceptable in society? The blue represents yes while the red represents no. You can see that majority of respondents, which is 96.6% responded yes, while the remaining, which is 3.4% responded no. Moving on. Figure 2, bar chart, levels of agreement based on customer service experience. How likely are they to recommend food delivery services to others? From this chart, we can see that 50 respondents, which is 33.8%, answered strongly agree, followed by 59 respondents, which is 39.9%, answered agree, followed by 30 respondents, which is 20.3%, are neutral, followed by 4 respondents, which is 2.7%, answered disagree, and lastly, 5 respondents, which is 3.4%, answered strongly disagree. From the pie chart, we can conclude that society is starting to accept this food delivery services. As the answers that we can see are very positive, which is the majority of them answered very positively to this question. And this is, and um, moving on, uh, from the bar chart, we can see that majority of the respondents are pretty much very satisfied with the food delivery services as, as the food delivery managed to, managed to be user-friendly and <laughs> managed to efficiently do their job. As we can see that the majority of them answers, answers very positively to the question. Now, this also is proven by uh, from the work of Dibalanche and others, the role of customers in the gig economy, how perceptions of working conditions and service quality influence the use and recommendation of food delivery services. They have stated that service quality exerts strong positive impacts on customers' intentions to use and recommend food delivery services. This has proven to us that the food delivery sector's social status has become better. As we can see from Caroline Lord and others, the sustainability of, from the work this, from the report, the sustainability of the gig economy food delivery system, delivery over eats and just eat, histories and futures of rebound lock-in and fund dependency. They have stated that disruptive technologies are already transforming working lives, opportunities, and the environment, promising convenience whilst having a time rate of sustainability impacts and conflicts. However, a new issue has arise in which the workers groups for protection to former workers. It shows that they are being discriminated and lack of job security. Therefore, the government, the associations, and the scholars should have studied the precarity of the sector by new regulations, enforcing laws, and even establishing more commissions. For example, the workers should have been paid during their city. They should have been covered with insurance, with any when they are carrying out the task, and the providers should have been fine if they fail to comply with policy. Many countries are taking steps to expand existing social protection coverage to non standard workers. For example, France requires platforms to cover the extended insurance costs of self employed workers, and many Latin American countries have the extended social security for non standard workers. Other than that, Indonesia and Malaysia has offered work to extend delivery goods. The self employed workers. This measure to improve social protection of which was the gig workers. To summarize, everyone should play a role to enhance and support this sector, which has contributed a lot towards the global economy. Um, before I end our presentation, I would like to share a powerful quote from the Skeeter Mayor, Bruce Harrell, where he said, A healthy, a healthy work workforce is a healthy community. No one should choose between making time to take care of themselves and making time to make bread. I sincerely appreciate the opportunity that has been given to me. Thank you, Susie. That's all from us. Thank you.
like to invite participants to ask questions. Thank you. Um, so, earlier in your presentation, you mentioned about online visibility. So, I want to ask what does it mean by online visibility? To answer your question, uh, to answer your question, uh, to improve online visibility is when your business can be seen by more people online, hence the word visibility. For example, when uh, a business cooperates and partners with a food delivery service like DoorDash, they can benefit from saving the marketing costs by using the marketing tools. Uh, given by DoorDash. For example, uh, customers can view your restaurant, browse your menus, and order all from DoorDash, hence making more people uh, being able to see your business online without uh, the business having to pay a single cent. So here we can see that food delivery services can help boost uh, online visibility uh, for businesses without them doing anything. I hope that answers your question. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. For one, I do believe that uh, the food delivering business will benefit the economy, but how can you be sure that e-hailing services are going to continue to flourish in the endemic era? Because most of my relatives noticed a decrease in Grab drivers on the road at the moment. Can you please elaborate? Thank you for your question. So uh, in my knowledge, the government has already noticed this issue and they have been uh, doing some efforts. For example, if you ever heard of Segim, the commissions for gig workers, they are trying to improve the um, the efficiency of gig economy by uh, establishing commissions, and also uh, more university. The law law students has been doing uh, mocking trials in uh, the court to uh, voice the issue. So I. I think even though there is a decrease, uh, there are lots of people who try to improve what uh, is lacking and the precarities in this sector. I hope that answers your question. Hi everyone, I think it was a good presentation just now. I just have a simple question. We were talking a lot about discrimination among the food delivery services. What about the customers themselves? Okay, we actually try to enforce a, a lot of, uh, we're trying to protect the delivery services. Okay, what about in terms of the customers themselves? Because we know they also cause uh, problems to the to the this delivery people, okay, in your opinion, okay, what are the methods that can be taken, you know, to actually, you know, avoid, okay, the delivery from encounter, encountering any problems as they send the foods to the, deliver the foods to the customers? Okay, thank you for your question. Uh, so, uh, as we have already mentioned before, we have conducted survey and uh, some and one of the question is asking the respondents to answer what do they dislike about food delivery services and a lot of them respond with what have you mentioned before. Uh, they dislike the food condition after they uh, receive it. So uh, after doing some research, we find out that the restaurant should um, should. should um, take action about this. They should have been aware of the uh, packaging. For example, if the food is too hot, they should know how to manage the food packaging. Uh, and the, and I think um, many of the platform has uh, introduced the system uh, of 
customers as the manager. So if uh, the customer have give them uh, bad review and feedbacks, so the platform would not support them and um, improve their online visibility. So thank you. Now, I would like to invite the fourth team, Smart Benton, to present. Inshallah, starting my speech in three, two, one. Ladies and gentlemen, will global peace and economic growth ever be parallel? Well, this is a question that will be answered after our presentation ends. But before that, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning. Sorry, and a very good afternoon. I bid to our dedicated judges, accurate timekeepers, elegant moderator, and not to forget our immaculate teachers and my graceful teammates. Standing here as a proud presenter and representative of Sekolah Menengah Agama Persekutuan Bentong, we are going to bring up, bring up an issue regarding the economic current reality and future outlook. A case study of food riders in Bentong, which is under the subtopic of emergence of nucleus and the gay economic sector, boom or bay. But before that, allow me to introduce, to introduce you to my working partners. Standing here as your proud presenter, I am Sophia, and I will be assisted by my technical assistant, Alif, and we are being accompanied by two more of our friends, Imran, who is our repeter, and Dania, who is our moderator. Well, ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, you are required to be ready with your detective equipment, as we believe that our research for today will bring you a new specs and perceptions towards the journey of living in Malaysia. Well, our presentation for today won't be complete without our background of study. We define the gay economic sector as one new way of work, a more immaculate way, a more flexible way, and more um more flexible way, as we believe that the gay economic sector actually offers benefits uh, towards their workers. The crux of the matter, uh, the crux of the benefits that this gay economy has offered towards their workers are flexibility, 
flexibility in working hours, flexibility in working locations, and also they allow uh, their workers to take short-term assignments as they deem necessary. And they are also open to lower entry level. Hence, because of that, we realize, we acknowledge the rise of number, the rising number of Malaysians who seems to be appealed to the, the gay economic sector. Well, I'll quote from Ministry of Economy, which stated that around 26% of the Malaysian workforce in 2022, uh, which is around 4 millions of people, are actually a part of the gay economy sector. Well, ladies and gentlemen, these 4 millions of people have successfully contributed around 254 billion ringgit to the Malaysia economy annually. Well, this is a big news, ladies and gentlemen. We believe that the Malaysia is very open to its um, any opportunities or any changes that can actually give a great impact towards the country development. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please take a next look at the graph that we have prepared. We put Malaysia, uh, the, uh, the growth of the gig economy of Malaysia in compared with four other big countries, which are United States of America, United Kingdom, Brazil, and Pakistan. As you can see here, Malaysia is almost as equal to, its, uh, to the percentage of the growth of the gig economy with Brazil and Pakistan, but still not yet uh, able to exceed the percentage of United States of America and United Kingdom. Let's get deeper into the 40% of the, ladies and gentlemen. So, the age Malaysia has conducted a survey for among 300 freelancers in Malaysia. And we found out that 66% of these 300 freelancers are around 21 until 25 years old. So, ladies and gentlemen, before you questioned why uh, our youngsters are the, maj the major majority uh, subject in uh, the gig economy sector. Well, this is because the gig economy sector seems to be more appealing to a certain course of people, which are students, uh, parents with young children, and also to those who are looking for employment opportunities. But very, uh, it, rise, it has risen a uh, concern of among EPF, which state, I quote, state, I quote, I quote a statement from Tunku Alizakri Raja Muhammad Alias, which it, who is an APF Deputy Chief Executive Officer, he, he is concerned regarding the importance of retirement among these gig workers. Well, we believe that, we found out that um, these gig workers actually have no guarantee of their future. Well, and with that, we have decided to take a deeper look to these issues. So, after a few research and a few efforts, we found a survey by Zurich Insurance Malaysia. We found out that 38% of our Malaysians and gentlemen are planning to leave job in the next 12 months just to freelance. So, the question is, what happens to other work? Why did they choose to freelance over other professional works? Well, this is due, this is back to our, uh, the cost of the matter uh, that the gig economy sector has offered, which is flexibility. Ladies and gentlemen, we believe that flexibility is one of the most, uh, well, is one of the things that is needed in today's situation. So this has led us to my, to our problem statement. So we um, undeniably, we, we undeniably realize and more than proud to acknowledge the growth of the gig economy in our country. However, we are a bit concerned. We see the rising number of uh, the Malaysians who give support in the gig economy sector as something uh, worrying. As we don't want more, as we as we believe that, as we found out that the gig economy sector does not uh, properly guarantee the future of our workers. So we uh, chose a pay healing service as our subject of case study. We believe that pay healing is the most appealing uh, service in uh, in the in the hearts of Malaysians. Hence, why well. uh, we started our case study with three objectives. So, number one, we would love to identify the Benton Food Riders' perceptions towards the economy. So, we would like to know what are their opinions and what. Um, how are they, how did they see the gay economy, gay economy itself? And second, we would like to determine the challenges faced by Bentong food riders. So we would like to know what is happening, what is going on, what are, what are the hardships that these Bentong food riders are facing. And last, we would like to find out the future plans of the Bentong food riders. As uh, for your information, as you all know that the gay economy, uh, the gay workers has no guaranteed futures. 
And this is our research question, who, uh, which is correlate, which are correlate with our research objective. And this is our methodology. We use two types of methodology, which is extensive research. We uh, refer to Google Scholar and Internet articles, and etc. And also, we prefer some questions to fill in our questionnaires to be shared among food delivery riders in Bentong, District, Pahang. So through our, our uh, interviews, we have succeeded in collecting around 15 data uh, from 15 Bentong food riders, which is, in, which is in the age range of 21 and the 30 years old. They are specifically working under food panda and grab food that lives in Bentong district. So before you question, why well, is only food panda and grab food? Because Bentong has no more than that. All right, so throughout our findings, we, um, we have found out that the respondents mentioned about um, the perceptions to what the gig, uh, the gig economy sector. So most of the workers needs uh, have to work. Most of the workers choose to work more than 12 hours a day. For your information, ladies and gentlemen, this actually has violated the employment law, which stated that these workers actually need to just work around eight hours until 10 hours a day. And if they have to be they have to work more, then they need to be paid more, ladies and gentlemen. So, because of, due to the fact that they are so committed, they are so dedicated towards their work, they don't have much time to spend with their family. And for, unfortunately, unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, most of them work as a full-time food delivery like this, and or do not have any permanent job. So when they are being asked, what are the hardships that they are facing throughout their working hours? So most of them are actually worried about the risk of them involving in road accidents. And um, we are surprised by the response that it is ha actually hard to, for them to get sick leave. And other than that, ladies and gentlemen, they also need to make sure that the vehicles uh, needs to always be maintained and they are also facing harassment by the customers. And other than that, other than harassment, they also need to face a uh, bad weather. So our last findings, we found out that, ladies and gentlemen, most of our respondents are planning to continue working. And some of them are planning to actually spend more hours working and start their own pension plan. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is a bit worrying. If you see the graph, which, uh, that... Uh, for the for the one who wanted to start their own pension plan, this is actually a small uh, number. We believe that this is a bit worrying as we need to, we need these workers to actually acknowledge the importance of them to have their own pension plan. So that's why we bring up this issue for today. This has led us to our discussion. So we believe that if we uh, have succeed, we succeed in um in improvising the policy and welfare for these workers, they can actually have a healthy and better life, which will eventually uh, will increase their, uh, their employees' overall happiness, satisfaction while working, uh, employees' overall morale, and lastly, the productivity uh, of the employee. So, ladies and gentlemen, we suggest that policymakers and business owners should make policies that support your workers to ensure their welfare. With that, ladies and gentlemen, there's nothing that we hope more. We believe that happy workers is a happy nation and happy country. We believe in humanity and equality. With that, we list our case. <laughs> I would like to invite participants to ask questions. Sure. Any questions from the audience? All right, here. Thank you for your uh, amazing presentation just now. So my first, my question is, how has the growth of food delivery services in the gig economy impacted local economies, particular in terms of jobs and wages and salaries? Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, I'm sorry, can you please repeat this question? Mm -hmm. 
We believe that, uh, thank you for the question. So we believe that um, because of the, new, the emergence of this new career, which is the key learning service, it has actually opened many job opportunities, which has then increased the economy uh, of Malaysia, which I have stated before that uh, these workers have actually contributed around 200 and more than 254 billion ringgit to the Malaysia economy annually. So hence we believe that the key learning services is actually very, very beneficial towards our uh, economy. Thank you. I hope that answers your question. All right. Thank you for a great presentation. Regarding the questionnaire that you have distributed to the Bentong riders, right? Uh, how do you actually conduct it and how do you analyze the data? Uh, thank you for your question. Um, we use a methodology which is questionnaires. We create a Google form for the participants, which is the food riders from uh, in the boat on the street, to fill in the questions. And so we conducted the interview um, for four days. Um, it actually take a long, a long of time because we had to choose. Um, um, particular uh, participants um, to answer the questions. So, so we just got 15 respondents because most of the workers are um, busy to um, deliver the food to the customers. So yeah, does that answer your question? <laughs> Um, we believe that, um, we like what my, my friend has mentioned before, that these workers are actually very, um, very busy. So we select, um, we select our respondents from uh, from those who are not really that busy, as we believe that. As we don't want them, to, uh, we don't want to inter interrupt them. As we have conducted a research about your hard works, so we see, so we have selected a, a respondents that is actually uh, have time to answer our question. Um, uh, thank you. Well, I think so. Um, at first, we were expect that maybe less than fifteen. It has to be great. Uh, it's a big success for us to get uh, to get fifteen, fifteen respondents. As um, to actually spend four days uh, outside is actually um a very big thing for us as we as we live in a boarding school and. Yes, 15, 15 respondents out of 40 is actually a great success, yes. Thank you.
Thank you for the presentation. Now I would like to invite the last team for today, SMS Kota Tinggi to present. Content creators, the key to unlocking the potential of e-commerce. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh to the esteemed judges and a very good afternoon I bid to all. I am standing here today to present to you this research under the genre of online shopping. But before we get started, I'm going to relate two key phases, which are content creators and e-commerce to the gig economy sector. Number one, content creators don't really have a permanent job. Therefore, they fall into the gig economy sphere. So what's the outline for today? So you all might be asking, what is e-commerce? Well, e-commerce is the digital buying and or selling of online products, and it can also be considered as the online commercial process. It consists of the main highlight for today's topic, which is online shopping. Other than that, it can also consist of online payments or even online services like booking flights. Now, how Approaches or methods utilized by content creators and content creators shaping the e-commerce consumer digital process. Now, let's move on to problem statements. In the status quo today, it clearly states that e-commerce businesses are progressing very slowly and content creators face such a hard time in effectively promoting online services and online products. Hence, so what have we done to make this research a possibility? Well, number one, we have conducted a literature review that connects surveys, researches, and journals that was done before to further understand the consumer decision process. Secondly, we have also conducted an online survey regarding the consumers, e-commerce consumers are regarding their opinions regarding the e-commerce platforms and the content creators content. We had received 117 responses. Next, we also uh, uh, conducted a semi-structured semi interview with a content creator named Nadia Halim, who is also the CEO of a lipstick company called Blip. Ladies, you should really venture into this. Now, what is the significance of this factor? Well, we studied the approaches utilized by content creators, and this factor is going to address two statements. Statement number one, content creators influencing the e-commerce consumers at maximum efficiency. And statement number two, the best methods content creators use to influence these e-commerce consumers. Other than that, compelling storytelling also plays a vital role in the content creator's content. Why I say this is because compelling storytelling creates, creates an engaging narrative around that product, or around that service, and it creates an emotional connection or, uh, between the consumers and the content creators themselves. Now let's move on to statement number two, which is the best methods content creators use to influence these e-commerce consumers. According to our survey, it was found that the method of product review is the most influential and the most effective amongst these e-commerce consumers. But talking about influential, let's take a look at these statistics right here. It was found that TikTok is the most downloaded app in the world with 672 million downloads. I'm pretty sure you all know that already by now, but it also aligns with the most engaging type of content, which is the short form video. We can see that consumers and the content creators all opt into this one app, making synergy and making TikTok producing its own e-commerce platform, which is the TikTok shop. By the way, it's booming right now. <laughs> So what is the significance of this factor? Well, we studied the consumer decision process, and this is going to address two statements. We'll be, understand, we'll be understanding the 
the mindset of these consumers and will be improving the effectiveness of promoting third party products. Step number one, problem recognition. These consumers are going to identify a problem where they have a desire for a product, a need to solve a problem, or even exposure to external services like, like advertising. Now, step number three, which is the evaluation of alternatives. These consumers are going to have a lot of choices and a lot of options at hand. Therefore, they'll you have to evaluate these alternatives in order to get the best, the most out of their, their purchase. And we can count in various attributes such as price, quality, brand reputation, and even the influence of content creators such as Ronaldo being the ambassador of Shopee. Okay, now, of course, step number five, which is the consumer makes the actual purchase. And this factor, this uh, choice can be influenced by many factors such as convenience, payment options, and availability of promotions and discounts are often promoted by content creators. And the last and last but not least, step number seven, these consumers are going to engage in uh, the post purchase behavior where they show advocacy, meaning recognition of that certain purchase to others and even repeating the purchase if the purchase is up to par to their expectations. But if it is not, it may just result in complaints and regrets and also returns of that certain product. Now, moving on, I will be introducing a new concept called inserting, uh, whereby I'll be taking the best methods used by content creators and I will be inserting it into the consumer decision process. We found that content creators influence step number two, three, and four the most, which is information search, evaluation of alternatives, and the purchase decision. Let me paint you a picture of what was stated. Imagine you are scrolling you, uh, through, through TikTok and you came across a video uh, promoting about a hijab brand. I'm sorry, I'm sorry for the male audiences if we didn't put any male products on here because why? Because we can. Just moving back to the video, uh, this piqued your interest. And uh, this alone influences step number two and number three, which is information search and the evaluation of alternatives. Now the video goes on talking about the brand, the quality of the product, the effectiveness of, of the product, and the material the product it is made up of, but in a creative way. This is where the factors of compelling storytelling, making a product review, or even making a skit out of, pro of the product comes into play. We can see that the methods used by content creators have a huge impact on the consumer decision process. Yes, Content creators has contributed a lot in the uh, e-commerce industry. According to the Malaysian Reserve website, in Malaysia, uh, from e-commerce transactions only, namely the buying and or selling of online products, has come in at a, a whopping 447.8 billion ringgit in 2017 against just the 398.2 billion ringgit in 2015. We can see that it has an 6% increase annually, and we expect it to do so over these coming years, but with a slight increase. Now, moving on to the implications for factor one, which is if influencing the co these consumers at maximum efficiency is achieved, hence content creators can promote effective use of uh, the resources at hand and uh, increase the productivity of e-commerce businesses. Moving on to implications for factor two is, if understanding the uh, mindset of these consumers are accomplished, 
Thus, improved promotional effectiveness means that more visitors to the e-commerce platform are more likely to convert into customers, which means an increase in sales and market expansion. Now, what is the conclusion of our research today? Overall, the findings recommend that slow progression on e-commerce businesses are going to benefit tremendously by creating synergy and emphasis synergy between content creators and these e-commerce vendors. And this has been proven by successful analysis of both promoting mechanisms utilized and also the sustainability of the content creators follower base. After all that stated, we can conclude that the emergence of new careers in the gig economy sector is definitely boom. Any questions? I would like to invite participants to ask questions. Any questions from the audience? No questions? No questions? All right. All right, thank you for a great presentation again. All right, can you explain briefly the findings of your interview? Because I cannot see from, from your slide just now. There's no, uh, actually, from the semi-structure interview, right? So I want to see, actually, can you explain the, the, the findings of the interview? She sold her product on an online platform, mainly on Shopee. On her early stages, before she became a content creator, she had received an, uh, an average revenue of 3,000 to 5,000 ringgit. But then she uh, have immersed in the content creator business, and then she had received a she had received a revenue over ten thousands. And what can we uh, say from this finding is that when you become a content creator, therefore you are more influenced on the con consumer on the consumer decision process. What what are we saying? Meaning that when you become a content creator, you have the power to influence these uh, these consumers. Therefore. The rev, the high in revenue of Nadia Halim's product. Uh, yes, we consulted her, and we also asked if it was okay. We could know the revenue, and she said it was completely fine. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you for the inter interesting presentation. As the saying goes, to every beginning there is an ending. And now the panel has come to its end. Once again, thank you to all judges and everyone for your time. I would like to apologize if I have done any